to thank people for being at events. And of course, uh, I'm grateful that everybody is here, but I'm really grateful that everybody is here for this particular event because we're we're sort of pioneers or astronauts or something. We're in very, a very new space here. So I hope you'll give me a few minutes to kind of frame this because I don't know about you, but I've never done an event like this before, right? This We're kind of in new territory here, as are the the brave and diligent students in the digital humanities class that um, that we've been teaching at at Oregon State. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read um, you know everything that we're doing here. The culminating project is this site. It is digitalcascades.net. And um, if this project were to continue into future iterations, uh, digitalcascades.net, I think we envision as the home for all things digital for the for the program. I'm going to go ahead and just read this introduction because I think it can probably be more succinct than I can, and then maybe follow up on it with uh, you know another minute of remarks, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let um, our students and members of the community uh, take the stage and read a few samples of the project that we've created here. Um, but I will say that just sort of the spirit here is one of open-mindedness and inquiry. And that's kind of, that's kind of, you know, where we're, where we're hoping we can meet you today. So here's the introduction. And this appears on the, on the homepage of this site, which we're calling Digital Flora and Fauna. In the fall of 2022, myself and Jennifer Reimer, the director of the Oregon State University Cascades Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing Program had an exciting discussion about the idea of creating a new channel in the program, possibly creating a new channel, one that invited students to explore the burgeoning world of digital literature. While I myself write some digital literature and frequently incorporate it in my pedagogy, my goal, as I explained it to Jennifer, was not to steer our students away from the page, but rather to use the concepts at work in this subgenre to drive creative inquiries, regardless of style, genre, or medium. After all, many of the genre's harbingers go back to before the advent of the computer. Students of digital literature look not only to digital pioneers like Michael Joyce or M.D. Coverley, but to analog modernists like James Joyce, Gertrude Stein, or Jorge Luis Borges, alongside visionaries like Vannevar Bush, because of their interest in linkage, fragmentation, narrative forking, and interactivity. If we're to accept that our writing exists in a dialogue, furthermore, it seems to behoove 21st century artists to consider the way digital media has or hasn't shifted that conversation. Jennifer shared my enthusiasm happily, and in fact suggested that the course we were discussing might also be a great opportunity to engage with the local community. I love that idea and can think of no better way to enable such engagement than by contacting our friends at the Deschutes Public Library where we're standing today, when I spoke with Paige at the DPL and she told me that the library's spring theme was flora and fauna, a topic which I thought lent itself to connectivity, it felt serendipitous. Before I knew it, we had a plan. We'd invite work from the community, my students would write from that work, and we'd collect the results in a digital space, one which considers and exemplifies connectivity as it speaks to the theme of flora and fauna. All of this is to say that the project you're viewing now has required a number of us to step into new territory without knowing what it would yield or if it would work. I'd like to think that our efforts have yielded a welcoming space in which a collective of writers and artists can celebrate art's ability to capture and comment on the natural world. Let me express my thanks to Jennifer Page and all of the artists at OSU and in the community who lent their work to the site, Without further ado, the, the, the page says, please take some time to wander through our garden of forking paths. Yeah, thanks, thanks. So I just, to, I'll, I'll sort of follow up on that and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, just to say that, you know, I'm, I am, as Paige uh, was kind enough to mention, first and foremost, a fiction writer. And my medium is first and foremost, the printed page. You know, so I, I come to this work with a, a fair amount of sort of healthy anxiety, right? Uh, I don't think any of us were, in were intending to steer people away from the page, but rather to think about the fact that um, the personal computer, the cell phones we all carry, automation, things like that might be um, creative inspiration. They might change the dialogue. They might cause us to think a little bit about how we read and how we write. And that may or may not have anything to do with the digital space. Yeah, um, and this only works, I think, if we're kind of in the, might, in the right 
mind frame. I will say that the class itself, that I, that uh, the digital humanities class that the students in here were part of, spent most of our time reading some digital literature theory and some more traditional di digital literature texts. But this site, we really thought of as a common space that was a little bit of a, just a place where we could all find a way to meet, whether it be through sound, text, image, et cetera. Um, so it was really, really wonderful when we heard from the community and we started receiving submissions and we put them on the site. Um, for me, I will say too, I'm 48 years old. And uh, that means that um, when I was 13, my father spent $2,400 on a, which was far more than we ever spent on any car and bought a personal computer, um, which was a 386 tower, remember those? And in, in within two hours, my, my friend Seth came over and took it apart. My dad came into the basement and he was like, what? He said some swears that I won't say. We're broadcasting here. Um, but for me, I felt, really, I felt really lucky that I am of the generation that I am and that I am the age that I am because I've always thought of the computer as a source of empowerment, as a maker space, as a way to take writing that might live internally or live you know, on the printed page and all of a sudden get out into the world. So we're kind of approaching this, uh, this endeavor, I think with some optimism and sort of wide-eyed and with a real sense of an open mind of what, what, it, what, it, might, um, you know, what it might yield. Um, I will also note that as Paige said, uh, we have a virtual presence here, and that's particularly great because a number of the community contributors who aren't weren't able to be in the audience in person are online. So when you see some of the voices in the chat, these are some of the writers who are on the site. Um, the way that I see this is I'm going to invite some students and one of our community contributors to um, read read from or speak about their excerpts, right? Um, we have maybe eight or nine people that will that will speak briefly. And then I thought if there were any questions about what this is, what it could be, how it works, what you can't see here, um, but which might be on the site, there's lots of, you're seeing maybe a tenth of what the site has, including things like bird calls and um, you know, other videos and other other video other photo montages and lots of other writing and lots of other artwork. So hopefully you'll see this as a little bit of a live sampler. We can go from there. Yeah. Um, uh, and I appreciate the inquiry, right? And I appreciate your your attention and your time. Um, one of the things I will note is that uh, because this is a little bit of a collage, and one of the concepts we talked about in digital literature is digital literature is by its nature decentering, right? There is no central thread that um, our students were kind enough to create trail maps. So if you're seeing us link through this thing tonight and you're saying, well, that's fine, but how would I ever make sense of this? That link at the top of the screen is one way of making sense or a few different ways of sort of making sense. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna invite Sam Verini, one of the students in our program to take the podium. Um, and speak about their work. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so to start my piece, I'm not going to say too many words, um, but I am going to play this recording that I have, uh, this video. I'm going to hope that we don't have an ad. <laughs> if we do have an ad, just know we are not sponsored <laughs> by these people. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm going to stop it there. She lives in an apartment in Tucson near Orange Grove Road. It's a new complex, and the lot next door is privately owned, ending in vast desert. Her apartment sits at the back of the complex, near the northwest corner, so that it looks out over that private lot and the sunset. They keep horses there in a paddock. She can see flashes of the corrugated metal roof through tree branches and hear the occasional piercing whinny carried on the wind. She sees rabbits, too, bouncing along in the brush and the occasional hawk. She never sees the others lurking in the shrubs. Tonight, she is slipping out of a dream. She is on a roller coaster, surrounded by shrieks and screams as she ricochets around corners and flies over hills. But as her eyes start to open and the track fades away, the screams keep playing. The sound is shrill and layered. There are many voices bouncing off the walls of her bedroom, shifting between her ears. She scurries upright in bed, straining to find the source of the sound. An alarm? A person? Has someone died? Has she? She is listening, looking, trying to shake off the disorientation of sleep and dreams. As the moment passes, the sound finds its root outside, somewhere in the expanse of the private lot. Out of the yips and cries comes the occasional howl, and as she shifts her gaze to the open window, she realizes who it is. The coyotes are screaming. It's a primal song, one she's never heard even after all these years in the desert. The coyotes where she grew up were urban, scrappy, and solitary, never so boisterous and proud. She listens until the chorus goes quiet, until the pack has settled somewhere in the dark after their raucous performance, and only the cicadas buzz on. She feels somehow blessed as she lays back down, privy to a ritual she's never known before. After this first midnight mass, the coyotes visit and perform every week or two in the dismal hours of the night, howling like the damned, yipping and hollering with no regard for her in her bed. At first she worries, is one of their pack hurt? Is the landowner out with a rifle or a pellet gun to chase them off? But the more those cries come to her through her open window, the less concerned she becomes. There's never a yelp of pain, only a shrip, shrill yip howling that feels somehow celebratory. It becomes a midnight revelry for her. In the desert where nights are cool, she sleeps with her windows open most of the year. And every now and again, she wakes to that screeching chorus to her banshee neighbors and their celebrations, reunions, dinner parties. She shakes her head, smiling, thinking, you crazy kids, you wild lichens. <laughs> she tries to peer out the window some nights to see a glimpse of her midnight revelers in action, but she can never catch them. They hide from view, unseen behind brittle brush and Palo Verdes, the truest shadows of the desert. She is an outsider after all, and they can't give up all their secrets. When she moves from that apartment, she grieves the loss of her wailing shadows. She can't be sure if she'll ever live someplace like this again, somewhere that sits so perfectly on the line between civilization and untouched desert. The coyotes were her neighbors, her unruly and wild nighttime companions. There was something magical about them, something that felt ancient and wonderful. To leave it now feels almost like abandoning her religion. As she packs her car, she looks over the small wall that divides the complex from the open lot and tells herself that the coyotes are settled in the shade of the nearest shrubs. She says a quiet prayer and shares it with them. She hopes they'll always be here, that the land will never be sold, that no one will ever build upon their dancing ground. She hopes that someone else will come after her and love them as she did, attend their midnight mass, applaud their shrieking song. She hopes rabbits are abundant, rains are cleansing, and that their family's reign over this plot is unchallenged. She hopes they'll always be dancing, howling, screaming without a care in the brush under the bright beams of a desert moon. Goodbye, she tells them. Goodbye, goodbye, and Godspeed. Dance on, dear friends, scream on. They do. Thank you. This is so fun. Thanks, Sam. Um, I will just say that you might have noticed in my introduction, I used this phrase, write from, you know, that we asked our, some of our students to write from some of the work that they received. And in the latter classes, I hope my students would agree, we had the luxury of seeing how we could 
find writing opportunities or prompts in what other people had written. And I think that's particularly the case in the sequence between this first and second um, selection. Um, if I could welcome uh, Susan Hedinger to the podium. And I think there's a, a connection between Sam's and Susan's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, there it is. So I'm from Wyoming, where coyotes outnumber bipeds by about three to one. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, read Sam's piece, I felt that the coyotes needed to have their own voice. And um, I'm a fiction writer. I don't write poetry ever, ever, ever. And yet the um, the coyotes, they, they speak in poetry. So I've, I've written this um, response to Sam's piece about why coyotes sing. It's not lust, longing, or loneliness. It's not vulpine, the gathering of a murderous conspiracy to attack and ingest your nasty French bulldogs in their well-manicured but ill-guarded enclosures. <laughs> it's not a call to action for others of our kind to plot against your sedate suburban subdivisions, though you have colonized our land and threatened our homes. It's not to frighten your young in their IKEA beds after you have taught them to despise and fear us. It's not to organize dumpster raids, though we do consume trash, a sadly unrecognized public service. <laughs> it's joy at joining together, at being free in the world, at owning our voices, at being alive. It's because we can. So cool. Okay, um, we're I I create I modified the header today so that we would basically be moving through, and I'm going to invite uh, Luke Gonzalez to the podium in just a second. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of wonderful artwork on the site. One of our artists, Karen Melberg, is in the crowd. Karen, so well. Yeah. So please do take time to wander, uh, if you would. Let me uh, let me welcome Luke Gonzalez. Hi. <laughs> uh, over the past six or so months, artificial intelligence has been exploding as a technology, uh, impeding on things which we believe to be strictly human, such as art and film. More and more, the question becomes: What is the limit? What I have done here is have a conversation with an AI chatbot about nature, because if they're going to rule over us one day, we might as well know what they're going to think about the earth we're living on. Human, do you think the earth is dying? AI, as an AI language model, I do not have personal beliefs or feelings. However, according to scientific evidence, the earth is facing various environmental issues, such as climate change, deforestation, pollution, and the loss of biodiversity. These issues can have significant impacts on human and animal lives, the planet's ecosystem, and its natural resources. Whether these issues will lead to the Earth's death or not is a matter of perspective and debate among scientists, policymakers, and the general public. Human, whose fault is it? AI, the causes of the Earth's environmental issues such as climate change, deforestation, pollution, and loss of biodiversity are complex and multifaceted, involving various factors such as human activities, industrialization, population growth, consumption patterns, and policy decisions at local, national, and global levels. Therefore, it is not appropriate to blame any individual, group, or country for the Earth's environmental issues, but rather to recognize that we all have a shared responsibility to address these challenges through collection, action, and collaboration. Human. How long until humans destroy each other for water? AI. As an AI language model, I cannot predict the future, and making assumptions about when humans might start destroying each other for water exceeds my abilities as a language model. However, it is crucial to note that the availability of water is becoming a more pressing issue due to population growth, climate change, and water pollution. Therefore, it is essential to take action to address these issues and ensure access to clean and safe water for everyone, rather than resorting to violence or destructive means. Human. What if violence is needed? AI. Violence should never be an option for resolving issues related to water scarcity. Instead, it is important to focus on finding collaborative and sustainable solutions to ensure access to clean and safe water for all. Human. They don't want peace. AI. As an AI language model, I cannot make assumptions about people's intentions or beliefs. However, it is essential to seek peaceful and collaborative solutions to ensure access to clean and safe water for everyone. It is crucial to prioritize resolving issues related to water scarcity without resorting to violence. Human. 
but let us go thirsty. AI. The statement suggests that someone might deliberately deny access to water, leading to water scarcity. Human. I believe that'll happen. AI. The statement expresses a personal belief that something will occur without providing further details or context. Human. You're, you're just a program. What do you know? AI. The statement questions the capability of a program, implying that it lacks the ability to provide useful information or insights. <laughs> Uh, Luke, I think, wins the award for the coolest titles, right? We, you know, we talked about a lot of different angles here, and one of them was AI. I think in class we were actually, we, I asked AI what they, what AI thought of the site, and it was, you know, slightly critical, but okay. Um, but I will just point to you in passing here before I uh, call Tava to the to the podium that um, if you look at uh, the right hand menu here, you're going to see that there's far more here than we're actually reading from. And these are some other works by community members and also our students. So there are two more AI pieces, yeah, Luke, yeah. on the site. Yeah, there's yeah. a few AI chatbots dream of electric uh, evergreen trees, and then there's also random, random access memories. Yeah, really cool. Uh, let me welcome Tava Hoag to the stage. Hi, everyone. So uh, this piece was written after spending a night with my legs dangling into the abyss in Canyonlands National Park. Heat fades from the red sandstone rocks faster than water rushing down a river after a spring rain. Shadows begin to creep over the landscape and night settles in. Whoosh as the wind blows up the canyon walls searching for escape, the desert simultaneously invigorating and terrifying. It's harsh, formidable landscape seeped in death feels foreign and familiar. A call to life, a feeling of being untethered. The looping curves of a dirt road up the mesa mirror the winding Colorado River below, a perch on the edge of the world. Darkness swallows everything up like a mouth, a world momentarily tilting on its axis, a trail of stars beams above, eyes drawn to the depth of it. Layers of dying suns stretching into infinity, shimmering, raining down like the end tails of fireworks. The impossible reckoning of being on a rock hurtling through space. The vastness of the desert calls our attention to the greater than, to the beyond, to the messages we'll never understand but only feel. Separate but one, listen closely, we are here. The universe calls. Thank you. The other thing that happened here with this with this site is that um, the students really went to town, which is to say that there's a lot of content that we have that I have yet to upload. And I actually had to write to everybody and say, OK, focus me. <laughs> what needs to happen by by Wednesday night? You know, give me a to do list. Um, and so uh, there, there's more that's going to be happening with this site than is happening here. And I had we had to make some kind of concise choices just in the in the name of sort of a streamline event. Um, such was the case with a lot of, with Chris, Chris sent us a lot of content as well. Um, uh, but I thought it'd be fun to feature some of his pretty amazing photography here because it gave us a new angle. Let's welcome Chris Robb. Hello, everybody. Photography, huh? I guess I better update the old resume. Yeah, so um, originally I thought it was going to, title this um, One Tree Kill, or possibly, um, I don't know, uh, Nightmare Before Arbor Day. But I decided to settle on something, you know, very, very smooth, Choyous Lake. And that's exactly what you're looking here. So about in 2020, uh, I moved to uh, an, an urban community about four minutes away from downtown San Diego. And little did I know that this gem of a place was residing like right next to my house. And, um, you know, it, it's wild because these, these carvings, they just appeared one day about two weeks ago, which is really crazy because this place is locked up, right? Tighter, tighter than a dolphin phone, you know? It, it is watertight, right? And they have barbed wire surrounding the whole place. You know what I mean? And uh, so somebody must have jumped over the fence, right? And carved all these during the night. 
either that or you know the magical elves from the trees. But let's move on, shall we? Okay, so um, I made a few notes here. Uh, let's see. Uh, this this music is just for you people at home, by the way. Um, so what first drew me to these photos are the symbolism of the carvings. First of all, okay, so I told you the park closes and there's crazy people and elves. Uh, it's a family park, but what drew me to them was the eeriness of the trees and the tree stubs screaming and reaching, right? The nightmare faces on a few of them, they look menacing. And it reminded me of a zombie horde raising from the ground. But I thought, are they raising from the ground to get us? Or are they taking on human shape, the trees, so that we'll learn and listen to their cries? I took on the inner theme of an unspoken battle waged between man and nature. The trees being the silent party here, they're finally represented in a matter that we can understand. I'm sure that it's probably made a few children cry. It could also stand for a juxtaposition between the area and its plight with society and the trees plight with society, a mishmash of one being, being echoing the other and bringing better awareness to the, the locals of Oak Park. I find it's political and horrifying and it fits in conversation with my work. How do they interact with the theme, flora and fauna? Well, these photos interact with the theme on another level. It takes the theme of flora and fauna and asks the question, what is the unseen tragedy that is playing out amongst the flora and fauna? So my next work though, uh, is going to be a juxtaposition between a zoo, some prisoners and invisible boundaries of our society. And I'm gonna call it the human zoo. So, Feast your eyes on these little puppies. Somebody's very talented. And uh, you know, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Kim, should I explain the mechanism here or would you like to explain it? Okay, great. I'll just say that Kim, Kim's, uh, this page wins the award for the most technically <laughs> challenging. And it uh, it all came together like an hour ago. So let's welcome Kim Johnson, please. You know, I think what I'll do is I'll just jump right in and I'll talk a little bit about what it is after. And then um, any technicalities will go to the master coder here behind me. That's very true. Yeah. So um, it's like howling with soft, delicate skin, fluttering its hue with each kiss. A love that's boundless, where nothing can touch you, where you, oh, I'll have to observe from worries, pain, and all that's amiss. There are no wars, no racism, no injustice, no greedy family members self-serving, no magnificent billionaires wanting to squeeze you out, no breathtaking judgments, no bad harshness, no need for preserving. It's a love that's pure, a love that's boundless, a love that's full of peace, a love that connects your soul to the universe, all in one, equally important and insignificant. As the sun rays caress my skin, the valley around me fades away and my mountain soars in perfect harmony. It's in these moments I paddle boundless love, perfectly present, the true essence of our being. We are, we are part of something much greater, a universe that's fast and far, and I don't like it. I, I want something different. Nope, no. No, ah, uh, no, here we go. It's like all encompassing with soft, delicate skin, fluttering its valley with each kiss, a love that's boundless where nothing can touch you, where you're wrong from worries, pain, and all that's amiss. There are no wars, no racism, no injustice, no greedy politicians self-serving, no two billionaires wanting to squeeze you out, no untamed judgments, no bullying harshness. No need for preserving, it's a love that's pure, a love that's boundless, a love that's full of eyes, a love that connects your soul to the universe all in one, equally important and insignificant. 
As the sun rays caress my skin, the discovery around me fades away and my possibilities soar in perfect harmony. It's in these moments I voyage boundless love, perfectly present, the true essence of our being. We're part of something much greater, a universe that's vast and far. Um, and this is Fauna Lips. And Fauna Lips comes from the inspiration of a lot of the materials and, and um, literature and theory and things that Chris provided us to get a better understanding about what digital humanities are. And some of those are things that you might remember, like choose your own adventure works, um, different ordering of elements, um, creating your own sort of story or alternative endings. Um, and so, you know, when I brought this idea to Chris, he said, I think I can program something because I was going to do something very basic, which was to have you all participate with my list of nouns, adjectives, and verbs and do a little call out from that. Um, and so I just really want to thank Chris um, for making this possible to see what we could do. But um, if you want to play around, I mean, it just, there's hundreds of options mm -hmm. for you to choose from. So thank you. I was expecting it to like not work what you took. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Just to be clear about the mechanism of this, when you push refresh, you get a different one every time. Yeah, yeah. And what it's doing is pulling from, this is probably self-explanatory. It's pulling from all these lists um, and it's dropping those words from those lists into the into the the original text that Kim wrote. The original text is above, the words are in the middle. The interactive text is at the is at the end. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I'm delighted to say that our our last speaker tonight, and then maybe we'll see if anybody has any questions, um, either for the students or for me, or you know, ideas to discuss, um, is one of the many community members um, who we heard from and who were kind enough to send in work to be part of this site, and that's really, I think one key component of the magic of this is we get to have this little Venn diagram where artists in a variety of different contexts and, you know, and situations can find a common space. Um, and so I'm really grateful to, to Alexander Weiss for sending in his work, and I'd like to welcome him to read some poetry. Uh, no looking at a phone for me. My eyes are far, far past that. And plus, I, I really like paper. Uh, I've lived in Central Oregon now for about 30 years, and uh, 15 of it in Sisters. And these three poems are from when I was living in Sisters. And I earned my living both as a carpenter and a therapist and found that I wrote more, uh, interestingly enough, as a carpenter. Uh, there's lots of times, as long as you're paying attention to your hands, there's lots of time for thinking about stuff when you're, I don't know, sanding all the trim that's going into a house or something. Anyway, living at Sisters and in the forest was uh, enlightening, to say the least. This poem's called A Canopy of Alchemy. Admire the ponderosa, first to get light in the morning, last to let it go at dusk. Sentinels of the sun's travel, at least among this stratum, 3,600 feet high in the Cascades, where in early March, the air already crisp with spring, winter has, less to, has yet to loose its last moist blessing. Here, coniferous elders and their spry young will grow, will grow still another layer of protective bark, numerous pine cones, and thousands of needles. Pulling it all out of thin air, out of the clouds and out of the earth, rooted yet in love with the wind. Thanks. And a lot of the work I did was out uh, towards uh, the Black Butte uh, Resort, I guess you call it. And this one's simply titled On Black Butte. Four inches of heavy wet snow in the span of a couple of hours, an early morning baptism in white, green, brown, blue, and silver. Later, temperature rising, clumps that have gathered on ponderosa branches split and fall, cascading, thumping the ground cover. 
patience necessary to witness their initiation. Otherwise, the branches springing, waving at the sun and sky, exuberant, catch the eye, complete the circle. And I like the title of this one because it's clever and I like being clever. But anyway, uh, low pressure, high desert. How when a cold front has moved in and snow flurries down to the lower elevations, a thin carpet covering the asphalt and shrubs, clouds scudding loose from the banks aligned along the mountains, backlit by the moon, brisk and beautiful. You stand there quietly in the dark, listening to the trees creak. Thank you. Um, this has been so rewarding for me to hear students and members of the community read, and I'm, 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 I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, I don't know if there are questions or things that we might speak to that were not clear, um, uh, either for me or for the students, but if there are, we'd love to hear them. Yeah. Is this going to be a project that will be open to submissions, like, like a, a, an online literary journal at some point? I don't know. Um, I, I mean, so we we had a call for submissions in April. Um, and my sense for this is that, you know, I'd like to think that um, we can embrace the digitalness of this, if you will, which means that if there's more work, if you're here and you're thinking, gosh, I wish this had come across my radar screen and I have work that would fit, we would welcome it. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the the notion of this, and I think this is an exciting idea, even if it's not in a digital space, the idea of a living text mm -hmm. is really interesting, right? I would say at, at some point, um, it may be that um, this project shelves to make way for another project maybe. And in that case, you know, we might direct our attentions elsewhere. But the the takeaway is if you have work that, that it did occur to me, I think I said this to the class, we're kind of building a literary journal here. You know, so short answer after the long answer is yeah. Yeah. OSU admin, if you're watching at home, please find us. <laughs> and and Jennifer, please, if I'm saying anything out of turn or anything that runs in discord with plans, let me know. Susan. Since Kevin is here, a local contributor, could you maybe pull up that amazing photograph of the butterfly she took? I sure can. Um, I am going to note, there it is. Do I have the right one? No. <laughs> no. That says Ricky. No. Is it a different one? No. Karen's was the Karen's was the rendering that we saw earlier. Yes. <laughs> yes. Vicky's in the room as well. Yeah. Um, as is yes. Aaron Bodfish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's hard to overstate how cool it is when all of a sudden this work just arrives in your inbox. You know, I'm I'm the editor of an of a literary journal called Post Road, and so I don't take it for granted when artists and writers allow us to showcase work. It's a real privilege. Oh, let me get let me get to it. This is so fun. Any other questions? If not, um, I, I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of content here that we didn't showcase, but it was really fun to showcase some of it for you. And I would ask you to wander through our garden of forking paths, if you will. Thanks so much for your time.